<laughs> Are you notice our gift this morning? <laughs> the skunk, our skunk. <laughs> he either got a little afraid or <laughs> or a little angry. Hmm. Okay, let's begin with prayer. Om Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadi Tamastu Mavidvi Shavahai Om Shanti 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 Hi Mambalar Sakura Shivananda Marjiki, Jai. For all the saints and sages of all the traditions, Jai. Om. Okay, we pick up Viveka Chudamani. And Shankaracharya began yesterday always with a prayer. And so, beautiful prayer to Guru, invoking Guru, um, Govinda. And then the Vedas, the works of the Vedas, up front, there are always two aspects that are, that are discussed. Um, the, and this is, this is Vedanta. Um, so it is a Vedic text, even though not part of the four Vedas. So the two are the efficacy of the teaching. What, what is the purpose of the teaching? Why study it? And the second is the qualifications of the student. And so that's where we are this morning. The question of why to study it is, yeah, Shankara handles it like this, uh, aphorism. In the, in the same way that we would go to see a doctor, and what comes right now is we might have uh, broken finger or something like that, in the same way that we would go to see a doctor in order to set the broken finger to, or broken arm to put a cast on it and to heal it. With Vedanta, we're dealing with, with a problem in the same way, but the problem is suffering. And so Shankara would say in the same way that we would go to get aid to have a um, worldly problem taken care of, then the efficacy of the teaching of Vedanta is suffering. It's to cure suffering. And so that's the purpose of the teaching that's being shared. There's no other purpose to it. it, it, it certainly through the process of it, of study and living that, we will purify the mind and purify the body and there are side benefits to that. But the, but the one reason, the one benefit is to relieve suffering, is to end suffering. Not just a, like a pill where we can get some relief from it or a drink where we get to forget about it for a little while, but to end it. <laughs> and then the, the student, qualifications of the student. I'll just pick up a little bit of the reading, the translation of... Shankara's words. He speaks about devotion, and, and uh, we'll pick it up here. But devotion to right discernment, <laughs> or devotion to truth, we can say. Through devotion to right discernment, he, the student, will climb to the height of union with Brahman. By the power of Atman, the power of I, or soul, let him rescue his own soul, which lies drowned in the vast waters of worldliness. Let the wise who have grown tranquil and who's, who practice contemplation of the Atman give up all worldly activities and struggle to cut the bonds of, of worldliness. And he's speaking of worldliness. He's not talking about living in the world, and that's discussed. Um, he says, certain knowledge of the reality, and that's the purpose 
of the study of Vedanta, the way to free ourselves from suffering is said to simply be, but profoundly, not, not a little thing, to simply be and know who we are. And since we are who we are, it's a question of knowledge. Uh, and we were discussing yesterday some to let go of what we are not is really the, is really the process. But this discernment is, is necessary. Shankara says, correct discernment shows us the true nature of a rope and removes the painful fear caused by our deluded belief that is, it is a large snake. Certain knowledge of the reality is gained only through meditation upon right teaching. And here we could use the word contemplation because normally we think of meditation based upon our own particular practice. But here he's talking about deep contemplation upon right teaching and not by sacred ablutions or almsgiving or by the practice of hundreds of breathing exercises. What we think of as yoga, Raja Yoga in particular, is really preparation. It's purification. Preparation, yes. yeah. Um, purifying what? That's where we're coming this morning. Success in attaining the goal depends chiefly upon the qualifications of the seeker. That's why we start there. Suitable time, place, and other circumstances are aids to its attainment. Therefore, let him who would know the Atman, which is the reality, practice discrimination, discernment. But first he must approach a teacher who knows that Brahman and whose compassion is as vast as the ocean itself. And so here we start with the, the student, the disciple. And I'll read some of the translation and then we'll discuss here. A man should be, a person should be intelligent and learned with great powers of comprehension and able to overcome doubts by the exercise of his reason. One who has these qualifications is fitted for knowledge of the Atman. Um, so a little discussion. We all deal with doubt. We all deal with doubt. How to end doubt. How to end doubt. How do you overcome doubt? When you deal with doubt, how do you overcome it? Sorry? Different practices. Ah. So doubt is a, um, is a question about the veracity of a thing. Correct? The truth of a thing. Or the efficacy, the benefit of a thing. Yes? Ah. So the one who's caught up in drinking, for example may have the conviction that I, that I need to stop. Stopping would be the practice. <laughs> yes? Uh, but, um, but the conviction is the way to overcome the doubt. So through reason, one sees what happens every time I drink, every time I take a drink. I lose myself, my memory gets worse, the physical health gets worse. My friends, I upset, I get angry with people, the, the sword in my tongue cuts people, I make others miserable, it's not easily healed because once I've done it, I've done it. Yeah, so all of these. So, and, and this process is a process of discernment, yes? Uh, so finally, I come to the point where I realize all of the reasons why I need to stop. And still a doubt may arise. Yes, we deal with this. Uh, so how to overcome it? My reason has to be firm, strong. Yes, my will has to be strong. My, my reason has to be, I have to know it well. And I have to stay with it. And, and work with it inside, and in a way, I could say, demonstrate to myself the truth of the statement, I need to stop. Hmm? And then I can stop, so I can overcome the doubt. At some point, the doubt stops because it's been overcome, it's been transcended. In the same way, 
here, we're talking about viveka or discernment, overcoming the doubt. And what is the doubt? What is the, what is the issue that we deal with? Well, two things, for example, we could say. One is, is there really a higher power? Is there really a higher power? Yes. Or is this just all as it appears to be? Well, what it appears to be changes so. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So now you're talking about reason or discovery, yes? Working something out. Uh, home. So, but do we have that? Have we experienced that? In the past, maybe, but... Yeah, the doubting voice. Ah. Uh, and so... Right. Did the doubt just go away? This is what we're dealing with. So you're giving us the example here. Did the doubt just go away? No. No, it was overcome. Yeah. How? Not by a conscious process, but subconsciously probably something happened. There is a process at work. Is discernment not involved? That is the conscious process. Of course it is, because you kept choosing to meditate, correct? Yeah. Now, you kept choosing to study, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. You kept choosing to show up and listen, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And when you heard something that made sense, you chose to ask questions in order to understand it better. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And when you understood it better, what is that? That's discernment, right? Mm -hmm. And when you understood it better, then did you become more firm mm -hmm. inside? in the knowing. And when the doubt came up, did you give the doubt as much attention as you had in the past? No. No, why not? Because you knew that it was wrong, correct? Mm -hmm. You knew that it was wrong, correct? And at some point you have strength of conviction, is it so? Mm -hmm. And now I know, yeah, that yeah. there is a higher power. Now I know, yes? Uh, that's exactly what Swamiji is speaking of here. It is a conscious process, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You see? You see all the choices that you make. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're talking about discernment, viveka. And viveka is, the, um, is actually the necessary. It, it, the name of the text, of course, is viveka chudamani, the crestule of discernment, the highest discernment meaning the discernment between the real and the ephemeral, that which is constantly changing and that which is never changing. Um, and so this study is a deep dive into this. But this is the one essential element, this and mumokshifa. And we come back to that. Huh? Vairagya also required. But... Um, but clarity of mind in terms of the intellect or the function of discernment itself. Some, sometimes we use the example, and we've done this before, Sherlock Holmes. And we get that Sherlock Holmes is a character in a book, but still the example is a, is a perfect example. <laughs> Um, most everyone, I think, joining us online has heard of Sherlock Holmes. Maybe you've read some Sherlock Holmes books. I used to watch some of the movies. He was a big thing in, in earlier days. The story about Sherlock Holmes is that Sherlock Holmes solved every case. And solving a problem is this discernment to the practice of discernment. Huh? Because the problem arises within the psyche. Yes, the doubt arises within the psyche. The problem arises within the psyche. And within the psyche is the, is the analysis of the problem made and the choices of what cure to pursue. And in yoga, Vedanta, it's the same process, by the way, because 
our suffering is constant. And at, and at some point, noticing that through this power of discernment, we ask the question, what is the cause of this? Yes. Uh, and even better, what is the cure for it? <laughs> What's the issue here? And so Sherlock Holmes is, 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 the, is a great example of this. He is said to have solved every single case. And he was asked, how is it that you solved every case? He was known as the greatest detective in the world. No one else could solve every case. How did you do it? And Sherlock Holmes says, it's elementary, my dear Watson. All I do is I investigate every single possibility and I eliminate all of those that are not possible. And what remains is the truth, no matter how improbable. And this is really the definition of pure discernment or pure viveka. Um, so, I, and this is the primary. The really the rest of these support the purification of the of the intellect. And so we'll read and, and discuss a little bit of each of these. Here we have the Sanskrit terms, and we'll make the connection. If you want to write down the terms, you may find them helpful. Certainly what will be helpful is understanding the qualifications for a seeker after truth and understanding where we are in terms of our own mental capacity related to the qualifications in um in a in an honest way not in a negative way not saying i'll never get it it's not about that it's it is what is the standard and why is it and how can i get there so we pick up he alone may be considered qualified to seek Brahman or truth, who has discernment, whose mind is turned away from all enjoyments, who possesses tranquility and the kindred virtues, and who feels a longing for liberation. And so here, um, Shankara has introduced these four. Viveka is the discernment. Vairagya is the turning away from the sense objects or the enjoyments. It, it's not so much the sense objects, it's the enjoyments or the craving for unity with sense objects. And we'll discuss a little bit more why. The, um, the virtues are, is this shat pot, which we'll come back to in just a sec. And the longing for liberation is mumukshutva. He continues, in this connection, the sages have spoken of four qualifications for attainment. When these are present, devotion to the reality will become complete, and when they're absent, it will fail. First is mentioned discernment between the eternal and the non-eternal. Next comes renunciation of the enjoyment of the fruits of action here and hereafter. Then come the six treasures of virtue, beginning with Tranquility, and that's the first here, known as shama in Sanskrit. And here we translate it as calm, but tranquility. Speaking of the mind, of course, tranquility of mind, balanced mind, equanimous mind. Ah. The second is dhamma, which is the um, control of the senses, specifically the senses. In Raja Yoga, we have the practice of pratyahara, which is related to this. The, the twin to it. Uh, and and Pratyahara consists, and Dhamma here consists of withdrawing the ability to withdraw the senses from the objects. And an example would be, it, it, oh my God, there's so many of them, but food might be one of the best. <laughs> our, our tendency is that when we sense food, smell quite often, or perhaps sight, but usually it's the, it's the smell, that immediately, if it's a food that we love, the salivation in the body starts. And it's a process. 
which is coming from the the sense sense connecting with the object itself, providing information to the mind. The mind looks in the chitta, in the memory banks, the file folders, and it finds a comparison for that, for that signal, that smell. And the mind within the chitta says, ah, pizza, wonderful. That's in the memory bank. Uh, and immediately the, um, the mind sends a signal to the digestive system to get ready because I'm having pizza. <laughs> Now that's whether you want pizza or not, whether you're hungry or not. The, um, the feeling is that now I'm hungry even though we weren't before. And of course now we're off to the races. Now we're trying to figure out using the intellect whether it's really pizza we want or something else that we want and do I have time for it and what will come of it. Or we just, set, we just step into the restaurant if we have the money in our pocket and buy the pizza and eat, even though we were going to meet a client at that time. <laughs> and so in the, in the case of study of truth, utilizing the intellect, we want the intellect, the, the discernment to be firm. We want to be able to sit with a subject in the same way that the scientist does and, and devote ourselves to understanding this electron and how it is that this electron is functioning. And then the pizza smell comes and the <laughs> <laughs> And so Dhamma specifically is control of the senses, the capacity to withdraw the senses from the sense objects. It's not speaking of the capacity to withdraw yourself from the senses. That's more in the uh, uh, uparati, the next, which is the renunciation or control of the mind. Yeah? So controlling the mind in the circumstance means to withdraw the mind from the sensation and also to withdraw the mind from the interest in worldly things. Uh, things in the world are not bad, but they're not what they appear to be. This is the, this is the issue that we deal with. And, and we have in the human experience, the lower nature of us is a program. Just like the phone is running a program, so too this person is running a program. And the, and the program is rooted in the concept that happiness is in the sense objects. And happiness equals, it comes from the, the gain of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. And so that program runs within us, even though that program itself is, is based on a false notion and the running of the program and our own mental engagement with that program prevents us from discovering the meaning of life, what's real and where happiness really is. And so this is why these, these six, so, operati is the renunciation of the chasing after the cravings or the avoidance of the pains. Um, Tatiksha is next. Tatiksha is perseverance. And perseverance, we could say, will come also more and more as a result of discernment and vairagya. I'll, I'll explain vairagya because it's related. And I'll, I'll share it from this perspective. Um, Swami had lived a big life back before the Swami name and back before the orange. <laughs> I lived a very big life. And um, I was always interested in something, meaning I was always interested in, in acquiring something or freeing myself of something. I wanted to free myself of school in the worst way because I hated school. So I had a passion about freeing myself from school. So much so that some days I would play hooky, if you know what that is, where I would, I would play sick in order to not have to go to school that day because I really hated it that day or I hated someone at school. And so that's Raga Dvesha. That's the Dvesha part, which is the, which is the passion to avoid pain. 
And raga is the passion to have pleasure. And what I loved to do is I loved to play with the electronics and uh, ham radio, amateur radio. And so I would pretend to be sick, get out of school. My parents would both go off to work. And I would sit there all day long on my ham radio talking with people around the world because that was pleasant to me, because I loved to do that. And then, to be honest, that, that passion, and people say passion is great. And I, I, from some perspective, passion is great to help us to learn because it, it helped me to learn that that which I was passionate for did not actually provide fulfillment or happiness. Uh, and the, whatever I was passionate for, whether it was I wanted it or I wanted to avoid it, that passion brought a whole new set of problems. Uh, because after some time, the most important thing in the world to me was being able to, to do what I wanted to do. And that would change some, the list would change. But in order to do what I wanted to do, I had to become a very good liar. <laughs> yeah? Learn how to tell stories with a straight face in a way that got people's interest. Um, and we all learn to be very good liars because of this. Because when we follow Raghadvesha, yeah, which we do, that's the, that's the animal in us. When we, when we are running after the pleasures, we want them all the time, you see. But we can't have them all the time. This is the issue I was having. So my suffering was related to that. I couldn't have it all the time. I tried. But of course, then you have to do something you don't like to do in order to have the ability to do what you want to do. <laughs> but I lived a big life. I, I, what people called successful. I kept getting what I wanted. And somehow or other, generally speaking, I managed to avoid what I didn't like, what I didn't want. Um, and the life kept getting bigger and bigger. And then one day, and it was really a day, in a day, um, a great depression came on. And, and I, I didn't understand it at the time, but it was, it was a withdrawal from that from that life. And I would tell you from this perspective, I look back at that and I laugh about it because it, it, it's utterly laughable that I had these notions and ideas and, and that I was so convinced that being able to have the food that I wanted, which was always cheese puffs, or to... <laughs> almost. <laughs> Later on, steak and sushi were on the list. <laughs> Primary, oh my God, oh my God. No, I mean, I laugh about it. So the, um, the disinterest in these things that we loved, that we're passionate about, that's vairagya. And as it were, it dawns on its own. And why is it necessary? It's necessary because that life is a false life. And that life, it, it doesn't make any difference how successful you are. Um, because it's not real success. Real success is measured on the inside. It's measured by happiness or satisfaction. Yeah? It's not measured by the attainment of things. But we get it completely backwards in the worldly life, because the worldly life is a life of attainment. And what do I want to attain? Do I really want to attain that which causes me pain? Is that what we're doing? At some point, I realize, ah, I have to experience pain in order to have what's real, or to know what's real. Yeah? And so the aversion to pain goes away. The aversion to painful circumstances goes away. But do I really want to live a life of pursuing that which causes me pain? No, right? But what I discovered is, but that's exactly what I was doing. Does that make sense? Joining us online, does that make sense? All right. I realized, but that is what I'm doing, is I'm living a life intentionally that will cause pain and has caused pain and will always cause pain to me and everyone else. 
Yeah? If you lie to everyone, can you have real relationships? Can you have real friendships? If you're always trying to take advantage of people, and it's very subtle, but, but always trying to get what you want. <laughs> ah, and that's that Raghadavesha played out. And so the, 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 um, the realization of the cause of the pain is coming through the awakening or purification of viveka, discernment. The, um, the turning away from the, from the lifestyle which is causing the pain, that's vairagya. So the two are related in this way. Yeah? And one stokes the other with more vairagya. And, and by the way, with vairagya, you can't, if the vairagya is intense, there's no satisfaction and there's no hope of satisfaction. And that's the good news in living a worldly life. And worldly life means that basically that I'm owned by the objects of the world, that I am a victim to everything here. That's what living the worldly life means. Because my happiness relies upon having the right stuff and not having the wrong stuff, yes? And by the way, this, this urge which is coming from the ego it is insatiable, this, this we discover as well. It's insatiable. It cannot be satisfied, the search. So it, 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 you can get to a place, and I feel like I did, you can get to a place where, where generally speaking, you have all the right stuff, but then it won't be enough of it. <laughs> <laughs> and generally speaking, you'll be in the right circumstances, not the wrong circumstances, because the wrong circumstances would cause pain. And so it's possible to generate, but then the, the sensitivity to pain, it just increases. <laughs> and now the thing that you didn't think was going to cause pain, now it's causing pain. <laughs> it just doesn't end. And so vairagya is, is, is this, and we can say it begins naturally enough. It, it, it has to begin naturally enough because, because we realize that this that, that being satisfied isn't what we thought it was. And, and, and so the turning away from, but not just turning away, the turning away is vivek, that's discernment. But the disgust at, at, at the idea of doing that thing again in order to get that thing that you know through discernment is going to cause pain. <laughs> so you, you can come to the place of laughing about it, but initially vairagya manifests within us more as disgust. Now, not at others. God, yeah. Frustration. Not at others. That God could be, yeah. But really um, with the object. With the object. Ah. And within ourselves, in a way, as well. Because the urge might be there, but, but as we begin to see through it, it's... So Vairagya and Viveka work together in this way. And then here we are, the, the sixfold virtues. So we've talked about calm, we've talked about control of the senses, renunciation, control of the mind, so withdraw from the senses and the sense objects. The ability to do, these are the virtues within the mind, the capacity to do it. Here is the interest in doing it. <laughs> Here is the capacity to do it. Um, perseverance, to tiksha. So how important is it to transcend the state of suffering? How important is it to live a beneficial life? How important is it to stop hurting yourself and to stop hurting others, right? So here we can see I'm hurting others and myself. And we can, and we can develop the, um, the strong interest it, 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 as if in the senses itself 
uh, withdrawing from the objects that are causing pain, which is all of the objects in a way. It's not the essence of it. When you learn the essence of it, you're fine because now there's not an object anymore. Now there's the essence. And the essence of the object is the same as the essence of you. And once you know that, that God is everywhere and everything, that everything is in God and God is in everything, or your own self, capital S self, even better, once you know it, then, then there's no object any longer. This is where the saints and sages will say there's only God. But these, these are getting you there. Faith, faith in the teaching, faith in the, faith in the teacher. Um, it, can faith be acquired? Yes, faith can be acquired through discernment and dispassion. It can be strengthened. Discernment is the primary tool to acquire faith. Faith is the dispelling of doubt, not the setting aside of doubt, not the, not the trying to forget about doubt, the overcoming of doubt, faith, faith comes. And faith will get us through, faith in the teaching. At some point I realized, ah, it's true. This is the cause of suffering. My life was the definition of suffering. Huh? So that's the, the, through awakening of the discernment purification of the discernment, we realize that. But also it gave me faith that the teachers and the teaching were well grounded, that it was correct. Because through study, we learned that everything that we suffered from, every tendency that we had, the insatiable nature of the desires, the relationship between the senses and the sense objects. As we studied and looked with more and more clarity, we came to understand more and more that the teaching is correct. And so we developed great faith in the teaching, great faith in the saints, great faith in the inner guru. Ultimately, it's all the inner guru, the inner authority. So faith is this, and, and faith can be developed. Yes, it can be. It can be purified, all of this, um, but it's one of the, one of the uh, virtues and required. All of these are. And then samadhana, total concentration, meaning ah, Peace Pilgrim is a great example of this. Peace Pilgrim says in the introduction to uh, Steps Towards Inner Peace, she's talking about um, this, samadhana. She doesn't call it that, but she says, she says that I have overcome the senses and I have overcome the emotions. Uh, meaning, it, 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 I have the capacity to do whatever I need to do and, and to, without a doubt, do it. She said, if it's time for sleep, I can go over to this, to this concrete pad or this floor, tell the body to sleep, it will lie down and sleep will come immediately. Uh, she says, if I, if I need to pay attention or focus on a subject, I tell myself to focus on the subject and myself, this body, mind, obey. They don't go somewhere else. They focus on the subject, on the matter at hand, and stay with it. And that is this samadhana. Um, and finally, mumokshutva, and we'll summarize here in a second, Mumokshutva is the desire for liberation. From what? From suffering, for God's sakes. <laughs> really, I mean, we all suffer. When we learn the cause of suffering, when we learn that it wasn't because of someone else doing something to me, or it wasn't because of the situation that I was placed in, it wasn't because of the pain in the body, it wasn't because what someone said. It wasn't because I didn't get the job that I wanted. It didn't have anything to do with any of that. It had to do with, with my own misunderstanding of who I am, what this life is, what's important here. Yeah? And my own 
psychological incapacity at that point to live in a beneficial way where I did not cause harm any longer to myself or to others, where I did not any longer cause suffering uh, and where I understood who I was in an unshakable way, yeah, in a way that can't be disturbed. And so knowing the cause of suffering, Momokshutva is this burning desire for liberation. From what? From suffering. And from what else? From the conditions that are causing the suffering. Yeah? And knowing the conditions and having, having this interest, great interest in withdrawing from the conditions, along with this, these are really what get us out of the state of suffering. Uh, and they help to cultivate the virtues as well. The, the virtues are required. And, and so here's the situation that we're, that we're in. And that is when we enter the study of the highest te teachings, why did we come here? We came here only for one reason, because we suffer. Huh? And something within us says there's something higher than this. There's something greater than this. It's possible to free ourselves from suffering. This is why we came to... Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, or Buddhist teachings, or the real teachings of the Christ, or any of, any of this. This is why. Because we wanted to free ourselves from suffering. Or maybe it's altruistic, because we see this as well. Maybe I want to free everyone from suffering. This is the Buddha. This is Swami Shivananda. Yeah. Um, where their knowledge of, of their being the potential to free ourselves from suffering, not just for me, but to be an instrument towards freeing all from this state of suffering. So, as we come to the teaching, what we find is that the first time we study it, the first time we we listen, the first time we contemplate, the vairagya is beginning, or maybe it's advanced, to be strong. And the viveka, the discernment, is still quite impure when we first begin. We still don't have the capacity to really understand. And we read something, and we participate in something, and we might understand a little bit of it. And we might think that we understand a lot more of it. <laughs> and the momokshutva is, is um, maybe not firmly developed yet. Maybe we still want to be free of that person causing me my problems instead of free of the conditions causing me to suffer. Yeah? Um, and, and maybe when we smell that pizza, we still salivate. Huh? And maybe when someone says something to us, we still experience anger. And maybe we don't really have faith yet in the teachings. We just have a little bit. Huh? Um, and maybe I can concentrate for five minutes. <laughs> and so we work with what we've got. And what we do as a student is we keep coming back. And keep, we just keep coming back. And what we find, practically speaking, and I think everyone joining us online understands this, when, when you take one of these texts, such as Viveka Chudamani, that what we're working with um, now, the first time you read it, something comes. And by the way, some disgust for it might come, because Shankar is very direct, you know. And he dismisses this worldly life, not the life in the world. Life in the world is essential and it's divine. But the worldly life that we've been talking about, which is being a victim to the objects, to the sense objects and to the senses and to the mind for that matter, being a victim. Um, that's the worldly life where we are pursuing things that we're going to learn won't give us the freedom that we, that we wish. Mm. 
So first time through, something will come. What's the prescription? Wait a little bit, come back again. Wait a little bit, come back again. And each time, the practices that we engage in in yoga, all of them, all four paths, are really working to help to help us to purify the mind. And at the same time, the more we actually apply ourselves, this mumukshutva, the viveka, the vairagya, they, they grow and purify. Um, okay, so we'll continue in the morning. All right, thank you. Tara says, by seeing the truth, willingness and resolve constantly reinforce making the mind obey. Yes, Hara, it doesn't happen by accident, as you know. And it's a process. Sometimes people will say it takes time, and that's incorrect. It's not that it takes time. It takes mumukshutva, well-directed. It, it, it takes a strong desire to get out of the state of being controlled by our desires. That's what it takes. And then, yes, practice and time. So, it, but we can't say that in time it will happen. People will say that in time it will happen, in time you'll be free, in time you will, which technically is correct, except the process, we forget to say, but the process is you will suffer Terribly until then. <laughs> and it's, a, it's the suffering itself that pushes you along with this inner voice that we can't hear clearly at that point that's calling us to get come out of it, to come out of ourself, this little self, and to be free. That call is coming from inside. It's a clarion call, but we can't hear it, not when when the state of impurity and still going after my big life in the, in the world or my little life in the world. <laughs> All I want is a little place of my own. I want no one to disturb me. Yeah, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> we were having a conversation with one of our dears yesterday who's, who's saying, you know, yoga is great, but I have children and I'm not able to practice yoga, and so this is a problem. But <laughs> so we have to practice yoga where we are, and it's our idea that we're dealing with, right? The, yeah. Oh. Okay, let's close. Short final prayers in RIT. We pray that uh, we will not have any more suffering than required. We pray that no one will have any more suffering than required in order to get us where we want to be, where we need to be. Mm. Om Triambakam Yajamehe Sugandim Pushti Vardhanam or vai rukameva bandhanan mritor mukshyama mritat om trayambakam yajamehe sugandim pushti vadnam or vai rukameva bandhanan mritor mukshyama mritat om trayambakam yajamehe sugandim pushti vadnam or vai rukameva bandhanan Mrito Mukshya Mamritat Om Shanti 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 O adorable Lord of mercy and love, let us abide in thee forever and ever. Ambalusat Guru Shivananda Marjaki, Jai for all the saints and sages of all the traditions. <laughs>